Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you, Michael? I'm really well, thank you. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to this podcast uh, interview with you. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a topic that is unique. Um, I'm not going to tell anybody <laughs> yet. I'm, I'm sure they've, re they've read it before they listen to it or watch it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's unique. And um, I'm delighted that you chose uh, my podcast uh, to come and tell your story. So I'm going to start just with the opening question, if that's okay with you. Oh, yeah, I did mean to ask something else before we get started. And that is, how are the how are the puppies? How are the dogs? <laughs> um, I'm not sure if they're keeping me sane or in, insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, Willa is one this week and Elsie's now 18 weeks. So, um, yeah, she's really big. <laughs> wow. So yeah. the, the one-year-old is the, is that the Visla? Um, no, she's a Labradoodle. A uh, mini labradoodle, and Elsie, the the younger puppy, is a is a Vizsla. Vizsla, yeah. 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 And I think I, I, when we had a preamble some time ago about the podcast, I I couldn't believe it because I used to have a Vizsla, Hungarian Vizsla. Her name was Scylla, and <laughs> she was incredible. She was so naughty and um but also a really really amazing dog yeah she traveled yeah. the world with us actually um, yeah she was in she was in uh, amsterdam that's where she was born uh with a the owner was a painter amazing painter mm -hmm. and then we emigrated to south america and she came with us she had to go in a boeing 747 in a crate and, oh which was great. And then we came back mm. to the Netherlands and then we came to the UK. And unfortunately then she had to go into quarantine for six months because we didn't have the new rules that we have today. Well, they may have changed now we've left, left the EU, but mm. uh, that was the most heartbreaking thing. Um, we, we could only visit her in the kennels like once a week. Um, and every time we left, she used to cry. You could oh. hear her in the car park screaming. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> no, it was was the most heartbreaking thing ever for with a with an animal that I've owned. Um, anyway, back to the question. <laughs> <laughs> Would you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? And um, with that, I mean just to get things warmed up. Um, where were you born? Okay. Have you moved around? About your schooling, education. How did you get into work? You know, your first job, how did that go? And then, you know, okay. share a little bit about your career. This is a, you know, it's about helping people start their own business. This is, I want to inspire people on this podcast. They can start their own business and hearing from people that have done that is, is really great. But we also want to learn the backstory. <laughs> so over to you, okay. Michelle. Um, so I'm one of six children. I'm the eldest. And the only girl. Um, wow. And I was born in Rustington, which is strangely only 10 minutes away from where I am now. Um, but I've kind of moved around, but always within the West Sussex, East Sussex um, area. And my family come from Worthing. So that's only down the road as well. Right. Um, I'm a mother and I have four children. Um, three boys and a gal. Who, oh, how funny! <laughs> all left home. Oh um, gosh! So now I'm insanely living with two puppies. <laughs> I <think laughs> get empty, empty nest syndrome. Um, just something to pour my my love into. I think. Yes. Um, yeah, especially during these COVID times, it's quite strange being on my own from a very full house with yeah. teenagers and children in and out to yeah. then completely nothing. Um, so, yes, that's where I'm at now. Um, 
career wise <laughs> and this is not where I started <laughs> um I left school and I trained to be a I went on a nursery nurse course um I was kind of steered towards that that was all I was good enough for right. um looking after children amongst other things um yes. and um Yes, I intended to go on and train to be a midwife, mm. but then I fell pregnant at 18 with my first son. Um, so I always worked with him. So wherever I was, he he was. So I nannied right. and worked in nursery schools. Yeah. Um, yes, so I did that for quite some time, always alongside having my children. In nurseries? Yes, nursery schools, nannying, um, children's wards and hospital, premature baby units. Um, so that's where I was as my children were younger. Yeah. And was it rewarding? And it all changed. <laughs> yeah. Was it rewarding at the time or how did you feel um, about it? Yes, there were aspects of it I loved. But working in the hospital on the premature baby unit or the children's sick ward was challenging. I just yeah. wanted to scoop them all up and bring them home. Right. Um, just kind of person <laughs> I am. I found it difficult leaving them behind, um, especially if they're coming from families that weren't visiting them while they're in the hospital. Um, right. In the hospital I was, that was quite quite often that the children weren't getting any visitors by the parents during the day and then come the evening there'd be parents drunk turning up demanding to see their children so wow. um, it was remaining professional when it's quite heart-wrenching you know stuff yeah yeah mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. and how long did you do that for the, all of that um, children's work I suppose up until I think 28 29 around right. then um, okay. and then my life changed drastically right um, so it wasn't appropriate anymore <laughs> um, no. as I changed my my I don't think it's was, it was a, a career I think we have a difference between a job a career and a vocation a job yes. we earn money for, a career we're kind of more into and passionate about, and a vocation is it's much more heart centered and a strong passion. So, yeah, yeah, I think that was my career, and I'm now in my vocation. And did you change to your vocation at that time, or did it take a while? Um, it's kind of evolved. Things were happening to me personally that now what I share has evolved from. Yeah. Um, but yes, up until 28, 29, I was working with children alongside bringing up my four monsters. <laughs> well, yeah. they're monsters, actually, they're amazing. They're amazing people. Yeah, yeah. It's hard work. I mean, four kids is, is a lot, isn't it? I mean, you're one of six. So mm. you obviously continued the large family kind of commitment there. Uh, it's unusual in this day and age to have large families, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But um, you know, even four didn't seem enough. <laughs> really? I come from a big family, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I came from a big family, so two didn't seem quite enough. No, I understand. No. No, mm. of course not. No. no and, and I think I'm just that kind of person. If it's not children, it's puppies. And if it's not puppies, it's chickens. It's just um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just having these these things to these, yeah, to pour love into, to have another yeah. heartbeat in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Well you're gonna stick with just two puppies, aren't you? I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not four, I think, oh my God. I think I've learned <laughs> two puppies is enough. <laughs> more than enough, yeah, yes. more than enough. Okay, all right. Tell us then what, what else happened. How did it continue from there? 
Um, so when I was 28, I became severely ill um, and was rushed into hospital and I was internally bleeding. I had colitis um, and they couldn't stop the bleeding, bleeding. So I ended up having to have three major operations, but they weren't sure if I would get through them. I was only five and a half stone and very sick. Um, so life changed then, um, obviously, because I didn't know if I was going to make it through the operation. My youngest was only a year old, um, my eldest 11. So it kind of turned my life upside down, but also as yeah. a big wake up call because I had up until then, and maybe after as well, been very destructive towards my body, um, very destructive. And even though I'd been diagnosed with colitis, I hadn't ever properly been taking my medication unless right. I was pregnant because then there was a reason beyond me to care for my body because there was yeah. a baby there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, that kind of woke me up into how I was, how I was treating myself. Right, right. And do do you think it was as a result of the way that you were treating yourself, the colitis, or do you think it just manifested itself I into think, that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm from the belief that all all our physical ailments come from some form of emotion. It's our body's way of um, trying to digest, like it digests food. It's trying to digest digest what's happening to it emotionally. And yep. um, if we're not able to work through that, I just think it gets stored in the body and it spells and turns into illness. And, and I think the symptom is often the last thing it's the body saying look I can't <laughs> I can't carry this anymore no um it's it's the vibration isn't it it's it's a vibration the energy vibration the thought provides that I mean mm -hmm. I feel that way anyway it's a vibration that then vibrates through the body and that then turns into a stuck energy yes yes um, i mean that area so that's the bowels is it the colitis is in the so i ended up having the whole of my colon removed oh. um and i had a colostomy bag for a while um mm. which was reversed but it's all kind of like the colon was obviously stuff i wasn't able to digest i didn't really even understand or some i didn't even know about to be honest and the colostomy bag ended up being a real reflection of how I felt. It was, it was a bag of shit. And i that's how I felt about myself. Excuse my French. No, that's... that's... It, 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 it was very uh, uncanny how that's exactly how I felt about myself. Um, yeah, and you had to carry that bag around. Yes. Which makes it even, yeah, worse. Yes. Because then you really have to face it face it yes yes yeah. exactly yeah so how how did you get you know educated that this is what it was a wake-up call how how did you was that intuitively or did you have to learn that from somebody it was intuitively um you know, people say that they see the light at the end of the tunnel. I feel I had a near-death experience or a angelic experience. Um, it's not something I say very often. <laughs> um, but I was writing a letter to my children because I wasn't sure if I was going to come around from the operation. Um, yes. And I really felt this strong presence around me. And then not directly after the operation because I was obviously drugged up with morphine and goodness knows being pumped in for an epidural. Um, but when I started to get better, I started to be able to e intuit things very easily and hear, see, know stuff I didn't know before. It kind of, yes. it woke up a system that was obviously, is in within us all, but I, I believe we squash or we 
disbelieve and so it's not really present but um I think the writing the letter to my children is when it kind of started right yep um so yes I intuited (laughs) yeah so so you felt something that was speaking to you perhaps giving you um a message a signal yes I mean, I truly believe it was angels, which was baffling to me at the time because I didn't believe in God. Or if I did believe in a God, I was very, very, very angry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I believe at the time it was it was angelic. I mean, yeah. I've experienced angels since, and that's how, how I can only experience the feeling. It's an overwhelming love. Um yeah, and tenderness that's, that um, comes with a message. And did did that give you hope then in that moment, or did that come later? Were you kind of going, oh, is this real? I don't know if this is real. Yeah, I thought I'd gone do Lally. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I think we all kind of question these experiences when we have them and yeah. um, dismiss them. Even when we intuit something or we know something, whether that's with our gut or something, we can often dismiss it because are we making that up or is that our own voice or is it our ego? Mm. Um, yeah, for very intuitive people, I think we really dismiss how intuitive we are. Yeah. Yeah. And how connected we are to other other sources. Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's <laughs> a big subject. <laughs> a, a, it's a massive topic, isn't it? Um, but you know something? I believe scientists are now waking up to that fact mm. um, as well. There's a lot of science which is proving certain things about you know the brain and you know where do things where do thoughts even come from you know and um so there's a lot of research that is taking place i believe i I mean i was just very briefly was listening to a um like a podcasty thing on the bbc this morning actually about a neuroscientist and how he actually predicts that in the future we will develop more of our another sense mm. that we are not able to tap into right now mm. um, because we think we've only got the senses that we have and this is a like a neuroscientist saying that you know it's amazing yeah and you wouldn't have heard this people speak about things like that 10 years ago it just wouldn't they wouldn't even they'd be embarrassed to even mention it that there was perhaps another sense we would get um, mm. develop you know and he's talking in the next 50 years so mm. he's not talking lifetimes away um but that's even, human evolution isn't it i mean you can't yeah. stay as primitive <laughs> we're always evolving and we don't use all our brain no. So there's got to be other things that we can wake up and experience as being human. Mm, absolutely. Okay, so how did you recover from all of that? Um, <laughs> it was hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was challenging. I, I believe... Um, it was difficult being a mum and healing physically and then realising I was also having to heal mentally and emotionally. Um, it was real, real, really challenging. Yeah. It wasn't easy at all. And then obviously, of course, going through once the first major operation was done, there were two, two more that had to happen. Mm. Um, so it was a challenging time, and at the time there wasn't family support around or parental support, or because 
that's just the way it was really and other people had their other lives and jobs and stuff so yeah it's very hard mm. but you did do it somehow mm -hmm. I think um I don't know where it comes from or maybe I do maybe it comes from having to grow through the childhood I did but um I have a lot of willpower and strength mm. I mean since then I've had um cancer as well and um I believe our mind like I I, I won't give up <laughs> I'm like something squashes me down and I'll just ping back up again I'm very um determined and you know I want to be here so you're I never resilient thought, really aren't you yes I mean there's a, some element of courage that comes comes from somewhere and I don't even know if it is mine but something comes up that um makes me want to move through these and see see the goodness in it rather than the rather than the terror and the fear and the pain yeah it's yeah I, I mean it's quite remarkable because that's why I'm kind of interested to know how how you've recovered because you know a lot of people give up when they get into serious illness and they get very down and eventually you know the body just does give up and you know they they fade away and cross over or you know whatever whatever terminology people want to use but mm -hmm. it takes you, you could have easily said i mean it might have helped because of your kids so you wanted to be there for them and therefore you decided to overcome it and with mm. that strength to make sure you could look after your children, you you overcame it. Um, it's it's, it's I, I find it fascinating one. how it happens. <laughs> well, initially, when I was younger, and the children was younger, and I was going through that. It was the children were my reason. Of course, they were. They they needed yeah. a mum. I wanted to be a mum. That's all I'd ever wanted to be when I was growing up was a mum. Yes. Um, so, of course, that was a value and they were my reason. But then there came a time, and it was when the cancer happened, yeah. that they could no longer be my reason. My choice to be here had to be because of me. And right. that's, that was a very strange one. And, and that was, like, intuitively guided. Um, that that external reasons weren't good enough anymore. That I had to want to be here for myself. Um, not in a self-centered way, but... If there was nothing else, then why, why, why would I want to be here? Kind of thing. Yeah, it started to change with the illnesses that were presenting themselves, um, because we can be very good at looking after and caring for other people, and still really rubbish at caring about ourselves. And where's the authenticity in that, and and the truth in that, where we are giving and giving and giving and caring and caring, and, and still empty. Um, yeah, it's not authentic. No, no, absolutely. Okay, how long after the colitis illness did the cancer happen? Um, the cancer was only eight years ago, so quite a while. Um, quite a while, yeah. Yeah. Um, Twelve. 14 years later, 12 or 14 years later, I can't really add up in my head. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but I was constantly ill. Um, I, I'd be in hospital like every other week. Um, it was pretty challenging because obviously food was hard to keep in um, mm. and scar tissue around where the colon be removed would cause pain or I would get my immune system would be shocking so i'd yeah. catch things very easily yeah yeah and so presumably i mean a time of recording we're kind of 18 months into a global pandemic and you must be in a vulnerable group then are you because of your illness past illness um i mean the the 
I think everyone got sent a thing where they're classed as vulnerable um, and I didn't. Um, but I, I care for myself in a way that I, I'm aware of what, <laughs> that I need to look after myself. Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm here on borrowed time. I'm here on my time, if that makes any sense. I'm constantly making a choice to be here. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. 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 Okay, so all of these <laughs> illnesses. That's a big sigh. That that's yeah, big sigh because I can feel. I I can I can't imagine because it hasn't happened to me, but I can empathise with your, the amount of suffering, that you've experienced human suffering, for such a prolonged period. So let me ask the question: Where are you now with your health physically? Where are you at? Um, I have been experiencing symptoms that so far the because the COVID the hospital haven't um, actually been able to diagnose me. Um, but I constantly feel like I'm receiving information as to why that is. Right. Um, I very like I intuit what I need to eat and and my energy levels and things like that. Um, my way of attending to myself is maybe different um, than maybe. So I won't take medication. Um, no. And I was recently taken into hospital and given lots of medication, and I truly believe I went into toxic shock because I was just so sick. Um, right. So I just attend to myself. Um, very healthy foods and even listening to what that is but yeah. also understanding that my body is trying to tell me something yes. um, all the time and um, I also realise that children who grow up in an environment where um, they're constantly in hypervigilance constantly in fight or flight mm. then their immune system doesn't totally develop because right. the energy is having to go towards keeping them um, what they see deem as safe. Yeah. Um, and so people who have grown up in, in uh, adverse childhood experiences can have things like colitis and cancer and autoimmune disorders. Right. Um, so this isn't something I knew years ago, but it's something I have knowledge of now. So that kind of gives me something to work with understand yeah because I didn't I, I was like I don't enjoy being sick <laughs> no, not. um and I have I don't make an identity out of it um no. but there but these illnesses keep showing up or kept showing up um yes and there had to be a reason why and I think I but I believe that's the reason why um yeah. is that my immune system obviously didn't develop as well as it could have done in a safe childhood environment got you okay so yeah there were some struggles in your childhood then mm -hmm. basically um okay understood and um okay so <laughs> sorry that we focus so much on 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 your health okay. I, I really hope it continues to improve um and you know if there's anything else left there that it goes <laughs> yes. uh, very soon mm -hmm. so how did all of these challenges get you through you know to to kind of uh, evolve into what you're doing did you have any other career or jobs or you know what happened how did it all come about in terms of what you do today I think when I started to get better and heal um, from the colon being removed, I went back to college um, to train in the holistics. And I've no I at the time I had no idea why. It was just something I felt really drawn to. Um, and obviously holistics is holistic approach and attending to the body and caring for the body in a in a different way that we're mind, body, and soul, that we're not separate entities yes. we have we are all of these um and it just evolved from there my intuition got stronger um and it started to be that I couldn't treat my body 
badly. I had to learn to love the place I live. So all the time I was learning, um, as in knowledge, I was also the experiences I was having in my life, illness, children, um, remembering stuff. My childhood was bringing wisdom. Um, it, it was, yeah. yeah. So a lot of what I share, I wouldn't say is certificated knowledge, although I mm. have trained. It's more wisdom. Yeah. Um, from being there and, and knowing how that tastes and um, actually having a different relationship with my body where I love my body. Um, I care for it. It's an amazing organism. Yes. Um, it's a miracle how sperm and egg comes together and creates this human form. Yes. And also gratitude because all the horrors that I have been through, my body's been there too patiently quietly yes um and so i have a lot of respect and love for my body mm. uh, and besides it's where i live <laughs> um indeed yeah. so where else would i be um whereas at time my body felt like an unsafe place to be and a painful place to be and something i wanted to destroy and destruct mm. Mm. Yeah. so it's very interesting how it's flipped yeah and the other way and that has been a journey it's not that was there one day and the next day it wasn't no um, it's been a journey with hiccups yeah. <laughs> yeah okay what what was there any specific area of holistic you know therapies that you studied um the holistic course covered all of it so aromatherapy Indian head massagery, reflexology. Um, funny enough, the bit I loved the most was reflexology. I love feet. Do you? <laughs> yeah. um, and just fascinating how you could touch a part on someone's foot and they would feel it in that part of their body. I just think, yeah, I love feet. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. I, I, um, studied kinesiology for three years and I was the only guy on the course and all the women were all reflexologists of some kind <laughs> 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 which was really weird um, but interesting as well um, okay and what did you have um, apart from taking the course were you then going to decide, right, once I learn all of these skills, I'm then going to open a practice with a couch and I'm going mm. to treat people on the high street or in a in a building with other therapists or I'm going to do it from home? What what was in your mind when you did that course? Well, yeah, exactly what you said. That was oh, right. <laughs> that was my intention, but that's not what happened. No. Um, so I think you know we have these plans but life often has other plans for us um, right. so at the same time simultaneously this hearing of angels or whatever anyone wants to call it guides whatever um, was mm. getting stronger um, and I ended up teaching teaching angel healing and things just developing through me it was uh, quite magical to be honest so the more I was working with the body the more something else was coming in um yeah. so the more grounded I became the more yeah the more energy could come in I suppose yeah um and I started creating stories and visualizations and meditations they were just words that were rambling through me and the company heard my voice and um, asked me if I would create children's stories and be the author and the voice of those. So I, um, so I did that. <laughs> right. um, so I didn't practice aromatherapy <laughs> and reflexology and all those things. I was no. traveling around um, the UK and the islands around the UK and abroad teaching angel healing and 
recording stories of children and which were going all over the world as well, which was wonderful um, being written to by children from Germany <laughs> and things. Um, but that's incredible because that's almost like full circle where you were treat you were helping children in nurseries, in hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, looking after children, obviously your own children, mm -hmm. and then you know you're back to that, but in a different way, and yeah. being able to help so many more with your stories, yes. I guess. Yes, and it yeah that's it lovely. was through my voice. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was that was lovely. I really enjoyed it. How long did you do that for? Um, I mean, I don't record anymore, but I still get royalties from the company and they're still out there on CDs or Spotify and iTunes and things. Um, do you, do you want to, what are they called so people can go and have a look for their kids? Um, I don't know. <laughs> they don't have to give <laughs> my name. Um, I, don't, I can't remember what they're called, but there's like a series of Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. And they're just these right. four characters. Um, and, but there's some kind of, meaning in the little visualizations um for the children and they get used in circle time and at bedtimes and things yeah, yeah. it's quite sweet because um one of my sons had a child on christmas eve so i have a grandson now <laughs> oh <laughs> and, congratulations yeah they i couldn't see him because of lockdown so oh. they were playing him my cds and giving him a little baby massage at the same time. So <laughs> even my own grandson chills out to them, which is oh. lovely. Well, do, after our interview, please email me a link or somewhere where people can find them because mm -hmm. now we've shared it with people, we, we need to give them the resources <laughs> so you can continue to, to get more royalties for you. <laughs> No, I, I mean, that's lovely, the royalties, but the, the magic is more that there's children all over the world yes. listening to stories um, yes. that mean something to them. Yeah. I'm, well, that's why my podcast is called Share Your Stories, because every story <laughs> has a meaning for yeah. somebody. Yeah. Listening to other people's story, you know, teaches somebody else about themselves as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. So no aromatherapy, storytelling, <laughs> which is brilliant. Yes, storytelling. Um, so what happened then? Um something again in my in my personal life, things just started to go wrong. Um I received a call from my brother in Canada, um, who had started to get flashbacks from his childhood and had tried to hang himself. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing that. Um, and at the same time, I was in the UK and I started to get flashbacks as well. So I think, I believe as I was clearing and what being more and more in my body, my body started to show me things I was now ready to remember or right. ready to, or I had the tools to deal with, whereas maybe then I didn't. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's it then aspired that um, I started going into sexual healing because it's all very well being um, in the body, but then we need roots as well. And if we've had some form of abuse or sexual trauma, then where are our roots? They're they're damaged on some level, and I don't mean damaged as they never will always be broken. I mean we've been uprooted. Yes. Um, so, yes, I ended up, life steered me into attending to my own sexual healing. Um, and I reflected on that as I'm talking to you. I, I believe it's because my body started to feel like a safe place. Right. Um, for this to arise. Yeah. Um, yes. But then, again, that was another time in my life where I thought I was going to do Lally. Um, yes. There are aspects of my childhood I remembered anyway, um, but these things were way, <laughs> way beyond what I remembered. Um, yeah. But then I knew I wasn't Dulali because my brother was the other side of the world. 
having the same experiences. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so the flashbacks that you and he were having were of negative experiences in your childhood. Yes, um, they were of abusive experiences as yeah. um, us as us children. Mm. I'm really sorry to hear that. And but is I'm I'm curious, were you guided to do the healing, the sexual healing that you talk about, or was it as a result of these flashback experiences? Maybe a bit of both. Like I believe, like I said earlier, that we can only share in the world and share with others who we are and where we're where we are at. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows why we're here, <laughs> what our purpose is, but I believe we constantly get steered towards it. And I, yeah. I feel this is my purpose. This is this is my passion. It's not, I don't call it work. This isn't work. This is something I love. Yeah. And it comes from here. But it's almost like the other things I trained in and shared with the world were the journey to this. Um, yeah. And yes, my own sexual healing had to be part of that. But then everybody's own sexual healing has to be part of that. The difference was maybe that mine kept stems from childhood sexual trauma. Um, whereas on some level, all people may have some trauma around their sexuality that stops them from prevents them from being fully embodied. It's the only way I can describe it yeah. <laughs> because we all need roots um, yeah. to grow, to grow. We all need roots to grow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, and sex it's... is the root of us. So. Say again. And sex is the root of us literally, uh, physically, and also where we come from, we're made from sex. Um, so there's so much to it. Um, so I feel my own, at some point in all of our individual human evolution, because we have an individual human e evolution as well, um, sex will come up as, yeah. as something that we we need to look at yeah. within our own biography. And it's not that easy for people, is it? Well, no, because we've made it such a taboo thing. Yeah. And we've also made it all about uh, the act of sex rather than it being something that we need creatively, creatively to um, be fully who we are. We can't miss all these bits out. It's like putting ourselves and life in separate boxes. Of course, sex is part of who we are because yeah. it's, it's what we were made from, a sperm and an egg through the act of sex. Yeah. Yeah, it's part of, I mean, it's part of the organism, isn't it? Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, in, it's part of who we are. Um, I, I've never, until you've just said it, it's it was really profound what you said, which is, that's where we came from. <laughs> and you kind of go, oh, really? Is that, oh, yeah, of course we did. <laughs> and it's like... Yeah. It's, you just have to take a moment and kind of go, really? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, you often forget um, yes. that that's how it came about. It wasn't yeah. a stalk. <laughs> no, definitely not. No, no. No. And why do you think the topic is taboo? And, and I mean, I know you've just said because people talk about it as being the act. But um, why do people focus so much on that and not on the other aspects of it? I think there's a, there's a lot to it because I believe when we own our sex uh, as other than the act, so our creativity, the energy of sex and all that that can create within us, Mm -hmm. um it keeps us small if some part of us still feel still feels shameful not spoken about taboo dirty yeah. um 
Yeah, I think it's a way of keeping humanity small, that there's some part of us that is sinful, for example. I think even if we don't believe in religion, there's an element of us that may have that ingrained in us somewhere if we really thought about it. And it keeps us small as, as a collective, as a humanity, and also as an individual. Um, Do you think religion does have a big part to play in demonising some of it? Um, from the people who come along, some, you know, sexual trauma doesn't always have to be um, physical abuse. Um, people are traumatised their sex is traumatized because of religion. Yeah. You know, things they were taught that they would go to hell. Yeah. Um, so yes, that is a form of trauma to their to their sexuality. Um, I don't know whether maybe it's just the way history has evolved, where some part of us had to be had to be expressed as sinful or bad as shameful to keep everyone under control. I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. To keep the masses under control because, you know, children, as far as I'm concerned, are very much in their energy. They're very alive. It's a sense mm. of aliveness. Yes. And we tame them. So if we had humans all like that, you know, fully alive and whole and not shame, don't know separation and don't know that that's bad and fully creative, it would be a magical world, but it would be an uncontrollable world. They wouldn't be able to tell us what we need to buy <laughs> and um, that we need that car to be someone or... yes. You know, we're not so easy manipulated then, are we? No. No. No, that, I mean, that's a whole other podcast, I think. <laughs> because I wholeheartedly agree with that, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the control factor is very much alive. And even when we don't think it is, our conditioned mind is a dangerous thing. And I yeah. think conditioning you know in the area of you know the our sexuality and all of that that comes with that you know yes. it comes almost in a as you said you can't separate it but we do separate it and put it in a separate box mm. and the box doesn't get opened uh, or discussed okay so tell us then you're here, you've survived for a reason through all the, the, the challenges and trauma that you've experienced to, to teach us, to teach the adults about getting in touch with themselves, with their physical bodies. Um, how do you do it? Um, well, I feel that a lot of people who have some form of sexual trauma or they feel that their sex isn't functioning as they would like it to be they focus on that and it's like poking a wound <laughs> and I yeah. work the other way as in well let's make the body a very safe calm um, pleasurable sensational place to be mm. so that the sex has space to uh, heal and breathe and come into its fullest potential. Yeah. It's kind of like, so making the environment um, the place for the wound to heal on its own, if that makes any mm. sense. I just feel sometimes the more we poke at um, oh, the wound or sex, the more it withdraws, um, yes. the more we're, we become fearful of that or the more we go into the story of there's something wrong with me. Mm. Whereas if we just in focus, it's like a farmer in his field. He doesn't focus on each tiny crop. He creates this wonderful field and that is nourishing soil and then the crops grow. And that's the only way I can describe it. <laughs> no, it's good. It's um, a good analogy, yeah. So a lot of my work is through touch because that's the part that people are most fearful of is mm. touch and feel vulnerable uh, and have mixed messages about 
Um, also because nakedness equals sex in our world. So these people are naked because then there's this whole knowing that all parts of the body are lovable and touchable and don't have to be sexually objectified. Yeah. Um, and it brings a sense of wholeness to that person um, and ease in their own skin. Yeah. Um, and alongside that, I will be teaching someone how to have love for their body unconditionally, no matter that we, yeah. we age, it changes shape, size. Mm -hmm. um, that body love is unconditional, just as we love our children and our animals. Um, we need unconditional love for our, our bodies. Mm. And it's all about the body, making it a safe environment um, for sex to flourish. And knowing that sex is something that we own, and then when we own it, we can authentically share it so that we have a choice. I can express my sex through creating a project. I can express my sex through internal moving it for internal healing or my own evolution because obviously sexual energy rises and expands our, our consciousness, our mind. Yeah. Um, or I can choose to share it as the act. So we have choices, whereas the way we've been brought up in sex education is only one choice, yeah. and that's the act, whereas we have a variety. <laughs> um, Which I, and it's... It's dreadful, isn't it? Because there is so much that goes on and I've heard stories about people, children, you know, that it's a big epidemic around, um, well, let's call it, they call it sexting, don't they? Texting, you know, but people are sharing body parts over sharing texts and things because that's what they believe it's all about type of thing mm -hmm. and but there's nobody well I don't know because I don't go to school so I wouldn't know but I suspect it's a symptom because they haven't been educated what it should be about <laughs> and and mm -hmm. Because it's a taboo topic, it doesn't get taught mm. because there's no one qualified to talk about it. So do you go do you go into schools and teach kids about it? You know, um, I, mean, I would love to. It, uh, I would love to. I would love to. And I did approach mm. schools because as you just said, when my children were at school, they were experiencing that. Mm. Um, and of course that's not what sex is all about and what happens before sex we need intimacy we need relationship we need to know how to communicate we need to know that it's not something we give away and give ourselves away to someone we share ourselves with someone mm. like the sun shares its warmth um, but the um, schools weren't very open to it no. at all and said it would have to be a parental decision in an after school club and they didn't think parents it can be part of their curriculum which if we were taught how to have better relationships that's part of sex really the act of sex anyway and I think it's also about allowing children if they knew the full potential of their sexuality um, that it's not something that they have to keep given that they have choices is what I'm trying to say yeah it it's a it's a global problem mm. and of course we know well it's a case of we can um, we can only surmise and guess we don't know but if we were to do a straw poll even the people that are listening they could write in <laughs> Uh, they could comment on the blog post for this interview and say, you know, why do marriages fail? You know, why is it such a high percentage? Because 
that area is not understood or dealt mm. with appropriately uh, or even discussed. Oh, yeah, I would say sex and communication. Mm. Um, and you can see that now in the world going off subject of sex, but like communication, people are socially awkward. Children definitely are socially awkward because everything's yeah. by phone yeah. <laughs> and um, online. Mm. Um, so how do we how do we create intimacy? How how do we communicate authentically mm. and honestly and tenderly? There's all these other things that um, that's what I mean. We can't. It's no good making sex the problem because then sex withdraws. It's all these things around sex, the body, communication, relationship, yeah. um, intimacy, um, and then sex <laughs> did you in order to help people with this because i looked at your website and you have lots of courses there uh classes um you know coaching one-to-one -one. Mm -hmm. and i think you're launching something new tomorrow i saw on the website mm -hmm. um so do you want to share a little bit about some of the things that you do so people get a, a sense of, you know, because anybody listening to this going, oh, well, where do I even start? And this is a bit fearful. Uh, I, I, I don't want to even go there type of thing. Um, yeah. So how can, how can we help them to make the first step towards you? Okay. Um, I think the first idea would be to let go um about the idea of sex but also to know until we attend to our sex and our beliefs around it then there's always an aspect of us that's going to remain small and unexpressed and unfulfilled um and it is part of our creativity so there'll be something that doesn't feel satisfying um and i think that's why people are always looking for more and they may change partners or try kinky toys and things like that because we know innately we know there's something more yeah. and um, I am offering the moreness <laughs> I'm offering the steak rather than everyone feasting on McDonald's let's say yes. um, so there's online courses where, which to me didn't feel enough I'm a very personable person I like to be with people I find yeah. this whole online world um, a challenge to me because um, yes. It's not sensory. It's not intimate. No. So there is the online courses, but you get time to spend with me to talk through the video classes. So they're interactive. You have video classes, but then you could discuss them one to one with me because I know it's a vulnerable area. Mm. Um, or there's working with me in person, um, which people come along once a week for six weeks and um, six sessions and then see where we go from there yeah. to attend to all the ways in which they can experience their sex in other channels. They have a choice to share it as an act, um, body work to start to feel um, at ease in their own skin, um, no matter what size, age, gender, non-gender. Um, so that is therapeutic as in its touch, but it's also a lesson because I don't believe it's going, any good to go and see a therapist and then not knowing how the hell to do that in your own life. Yeah. And it's really disempowering, so I, I teach everything I know. Right. Um, and that may not make very good business sense. <laughs> um, mm. but to me, it makes the world a better place. If yeah. more and more and more people are living this, um, the better not yeah. just for ourselves as adults but then how we how we uh, teach our own children about bodies and sex yes and uh, creativity and life fulfillment and all those things that this kind of is inclusive of yeah. um, yes and then of course there's the tantra hub which is a community group yes. um, which people can come in and and um, have an experience of me and support each other as well. Um, I know it can be a challenging subject 
to speak about, but I think it's getting over until we come out over that uncomfortableness. We're not going to reach a state of comfortness. That makes any any sense. Yeah. At some point, yeah. because it's part of who we are, it's got to be something we look at. Yeah. Or it's always going to be a part of us missing, and I think that's how it felt for me. I always felt missing, um, which is a strange thing. I felt missing from my life. I felt lonely in my life, even though I was surrounded by a big family. Yes. Um, and now I don't feel like that anymore. Mm. I feel I have and know all aspects of myself. That's and amazing. Kind of reclaimed them as well as not broken. So if you've been sexually traumatized, it's this idea that you're broken or damaged or... Mm. Um, but they're not. No. <laughs> they're not. And in terms of you learning about it, you, did you go back to holistic training to learn about it or did you develop your courses and your knowledge yourself? It's a bit of both, but more the latter. Yeah. So I have... Um, certifications trauma studies and yoga for trauma and things like that sexual healing tantra yes um but it's more a, a listening so I, I share what i've experienced mm. so a lot of meditations and and uh the touch i share it's i don't know <laughs> it's something a lot of the time my hands are being moved it's a very strange experience, not strange, right. curious. Right. Um, and often I'm able to hear the body speaking, which is something that couldn't be taught. Um, so I may touch someone's knee or someone's back and I will hear something or I will see something and then I'll share it with them. And it will usually be something from their childhood or a relationship. Um, yeah, I think like going back to the beginning of the conversation is some things that we're all here to do, whether that's play a guitar, sing a song, <laughs> bake people cakes, or touch people so that their bodies feel home. Mm. Uh, yeah. And as, yeah. in that case, we can't be taught it because it's something very in us. Yes. Yeah. Wow, uh, it, it's it's really incredible work you're doing there, Michelle. So, um, and badly needed, and and I know you're saying online isn't great, but it does allow you to reach more people, um, mm. even with the theory, even if you can't do it physically with people, um, still being able to touch them from a distance. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, talking uh, earlier, we were talking about science and senses. This same scientist, neuroscientist I was listening to, mm -hmm. he did a TED talk, which I'll find and I'll send it to you. Um, but he developed, when he did his TED talk, there were some um, investors in the audience and they approached him afterwards and they wanted to give him money to set up a business in terms of what he was talking about. And he developed a, a wristband um, for blind people um, that they could, um, sorry, deaf people, not blind people, deaf okay. people, so they could hear through the skin. <laughs> so the, the wristband would vibrate and tell them certain things. That's amazing. Uh, to what to to see color to hear color, mm -hmm. um, or different things, words. I, I he didn't go into detail, but mm -hmm. he then talked about um, the kind of things that they're developing, where you could tell long distance they're doing something around social media and Twitter and everything, but eventually they you could do using this wristband, um, you could feel through your skin what your loved one was feeling, even though they might be thousands of miles away. Oh, my days. So, 
something called like buzz or whatever i i, I can't I, i'm going to research it because i found it fascinating <laughs> but yeah. thinking about your um reaching out to people how about you could sense through their skin uh or th through this wristband on your skin you could sense where they were at in their body can mm. you imagine that that'd be amazing <laughs> from a long way away <laughs> yeah so the technology is coming <laughs> that's what i'm saying <laughs> amazing um, we, we're, we're all fed up with zoom i am too i promise you <laughs> even though i do podcasting it's just which I love. Touch is so important mm. yeah. um and it's fading more and more or becoming more of a fearful a, a fearful aspect of our lives yeah um yeah. but we hunger for it we need it yeah. Michelle, it's a really fascinating topic um, and incredible work you're doing. So would you be able to share with us where they where people can find you and learn more about you and get in touch with you? Um, it's just my website, michellerobertin.com. Um, okay, that's it. perfect. <laughs> and there's a contact form and it's kind of it's a doorway into other into other websites sharing exactly so if it's sexual trauma you're looking for if it's more for touch therapy um that website will guide you and, and the lessons the online lessons are there as well um, and one-to-one -one coaching online as you say thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, i hope lots of people kind of you know think differently after listening to this interview and well, at least explore, uh, mm -hmm. go to your website and read some stuff and get in touch with you. And I wish you a lot of fantastic, fabulous wellness and health Thank um, you. and really fantastic success in helping to heal people. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And maybe one day we will see each other in person, too. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.